17. We have the week before us where we get to enjoy family, uh, travel some places, enjoy fellowship around food, and remind ourselves of the tremendous blessings of the Lord to us personally. I want to speak to that subject this morning, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. The Bible says, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he'd entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice, he glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleans, but where are the nine? There are, these are not found that return to give thanks or give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. Our theme obviously is thanksgiving, but our title comes out of that phrase, verse 18, there are not found that return to give thanks. In the country where I'm from, this phrase is instantly recognized by me and should be recognized by others because when you sit down to enjoy a meal, they generally would say we need to return thanks. Now, let me clarify that. That's if you're proper and went to school. If you didn't go to school and you just wanted to be spiritual, you say you turn thanks. You don't put the return part in it, but we understood it. This morning, I want to talk to you on this subject of how we ought to, every one of us, return thanks. What that truly means for us. And trust me, it isn't about the turkey or the dressing. And I don't know where this song comes from, but it's all over the place. It's not about the beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> it's not about that. Ham, yam, hogs, dogs. Y'all heard that song out already? I'm not on the internet, but people that Facebook you, they send that stuff out all the time. And now that song has just gone crazy. You know, <laughs> beans, greens, ham, jam, tomatoes, potatoes, whatever it is, you know what it is, okay. <laughs> but my point is, there is a lot more substance than beans and greens, particularly coming out of this sermon, okay? Uh, turn with me to Luke 9. I need to set the text. I always like to set the setting because it helps us to understand the message. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. In Luke 9, 51. Are you there? The Bible says, and it came to pass. Watch this. When the time was come that he should be received up, that's Jesus going back up. He steadfastly set his face to go up to what? He's, this is his final journey down in Jerusalem. This is, this, this is where he's headed to now because this is where he will go and make that ultimate sacrifice uh, for the whole world, the whole world uh, at Calvary. And so now he's in that last leg. If you look over in Luke chapter 19 and verse 28, you'll find that he arrives there eventually. Verse 28 says, and when he had thus spake, had spoken, had, he had thus spoken, he went before and ascended to what? So everything between chapter 9 and what you see in 19 is as he is on his way to Jerusalem. He's about to make that final journey to Jerusalem. And on his way down there, he's going to teach and preach and perform many, many miracles. 
And it is here as he is crisscrossing. There doesn't seem to be, as you read Luke and other places, there doesn't seem to be any pattern to it. He crisscrosses from one city in Galilee to another city to another city over to Samaria and then he's back. We know that he had already ordained and chosen 12. And if you'll back up to Luke, I think it's chapter uh, 10. He not only had chosen the 12, but on this final leg, he's going to do something else. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. And he sent them two and two before his face into every place and city whether he himself would come. And he told them, if you're reading there, things that they were to do, why they were to go, because the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few. He told them to go do certain things. He told them that, hey, don't take coats, don't receive funds. I want you to go represent me in these cities. You'll be my forerunners. Give them my name. Tell them who's coming. Some cities received him. Some rejected him. They were given the authority to do some miracles to validate, to authenticate that who was coming was there. If they wouldn't receive him, they were to shake off the dust uh, of their feet as a symbol to that city that they had had the messenger of God come and they rejected him. And he told those cities, as you read this, that it would have been better for Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be better. Because if they had heard and seen what you are hearing and seeing, they would have repented. And so he's, he's, he's making that leg, but as he, as he does, he is doing many, many works and many, many wonders at this time. And so what you find here in this time frame is one of these wondrous things that he does with these that are called the ten lepers. Go back to Luke 17. He meets or has a meeting with the ten. And there's a common denominator among them. They're all lepers. Now, I need to do something. I can paint a picture in your mind, verbally, or I can show you a picture. And I think this morning, you might be better helped by seeing a picture. So I'm going to show you some pictures of people with leprosy. But I need you to cover your little children's eyes. Do it like you do it at home. Because, you know, they do a lot of stuff on TV kids can't see, and you try to get to them quick. But because they're young, the little bitty ones, I don't want them looking. And the little bitty has to be by your determination. So tell them to, yeah, tell them to count, close their eyes and count to 10. They'll be fine. Not out loud, but they'll be fine. So for the little bitty ones, would you just a moment just kind of shield them for a second, parents, while you're looking up here? They're nosy. They're not shielding nobody's eyes. <laughs> All right, little Daryl, you gonna be okay? All right, he's trying to decide. I think just close your eyes, okay, little Daryl, close your eyes. Just, just bow your heads. Now, if you would, for just a moment, show me the first. This is facial. The facial one is the toughest one, and I don't want to shock children this morning. That's not the goal of the sermon, but I want you to feel with me what these 10 lepers were feeling. Miss Risa, would you please? That is a form of leprosy. Okay, next slide. That's leprosy. Next slide. That's leprosy. Next slide. That's leprosy. Next slide. That's leprosy. Thank you. And I need you to understand you have seen the best of it, not the worst of it. What it does to the human body, all parts of the body, would shock you. These were lepers. And I want you to imagine with me what these 10 had. Because all 10 of them, in some form or another, was affected with this thing called leprosy. Uh, they were all this way. Leprosy is one of the worst disease of that day. Today, it's called Hansen's disease. And there are antibiotics because it's a bacteria. If you can catch it early, you can stop it. But they didn't have it then. So imagine in that day, it was called the incurable. It was called the disease. We use the term the living dead because you're really alive, but you're dead at the same time. It was a disease that could affect every part 
and you're only seeing some parts. Modesty would require we don't show you any more or anything else. And each case could be, there was one, the facial was so bad, I knew that that would not be appropriate even for an adult crowd. It attacks the body, it causes lesions, pulses, sores. The fingers and the missing limbs are because you lose nerves. And when you lose the ability to feel, those, you do damage to those parts of the body. You know, if you hit your finger, you hit and you stop. But they would lose nerve. If there's numbness first, and then after a period of time, they have so injured themselves by those nerves and things that their limbs basically, they don't fall off, but they will come off because there's no way to feel. It can happen to feet, it happens to ears, it happens to noses. Um, it's damaging to every part of the body, including blindness that it, it will actually so cover the face that either you will go blind or you will have no ability to close the eyelids. It, it, it's kind of, from our perspective, it's hard to imagine what that disease would have been like. But I've tried to do the best I could by pictures to put you in their seats. You, it was a physical problem, but it was also a social problem. Because the moment you contacted it, you had to isolate yourselves from family. You were declared ceremonially unclean. Uh, you could not be around your children. You could not be around your wife. You could not live in your house. You basically had to move out into a setting either by yourselves or with others. You had to let it be known when you were in an area. You do know your Bible. So one of the things you had to do as you traveled, if someone came near you and you had the disease, what did you have to do, church? You cupped your hands together to warn them at a distance. Unclean! You had to pronounce that on yourselves. You had to declare that clearly so that others could hear it. And if you didn't, and you wound up in a person's presence suddenly or underwear, they had every right to stone you, kill you, or burn you because you did not watch out for others' health as well. In the, our own nation, it's called Carvile, C-R-V, Carville, Louisiana, it's near Baton Rouge. It is the one place in the U.S. where the U.S. did maintain a leper clinic or leper hospital. At its height, in America, over 400 people with leprosy. Uh, it was open from 1894, watch this, to 1999. That's when they closed it. You said leprosy doesn't exist today. Yes, it does, even in America. There are over 100 cases of leprosy in America. Primarily, it's from people who migrate from Vietnam, Cambodia, southern parts of uh, uh, South, Amer South America, some parts of sub-Africa. Uh, sub uh, it's pretty much dealt with, but in a lot of those countries, China, they still have leper colonies. And in China, some places, what they choose to do when they find that you have leprosy, they don't give you the option of going to a colony. They simply just kill you and burn you because they're trying to eradicate the disease. In other words, it's a terrible thing to have. You and I, we are we may not have the best skin in the world, but you're blessed to have what you have. And so he met these 10 that had this, had this disease that we just can't imagine what it would be like to live with. Now, there is something that takes place when they meet Jesus. Verse 12 says, a certain village, we don't know which one. Luke 17 says, they met him somewhere they intersected with him. And uh, they begin to uh, lift up their voice because they couldn't come near him. And they had to stand afar off to do this. And they scream to the top of their voices. And this is not some low murmur. This was a, a cry for him to have mercy. And they were very specific what they were asking Jesus to do, which was to have mercy. Um, it would not be a stretch. We would not be out of bounds. We would not be thinking 
radical to think, why would these ten lepers come to him? And it would not be out of bounds to imagine that somewhere on this final leg, these ten have heard that Jesus has the ability to what? Leprosy. It would, it's the only reason you would explain why all of them in unison would come to this one person and in unified name and in unified request ask Jesus to do something that was, was necessary, needed, but had not been done to them. Turn back over to Luke because the one time that leprosy apart from this is mentioned in Luke is in chapter 5 in Luke the fifth chapter look at verse 12 could have been this man we are familiar with another man that is called Simon the leper we, I, I am certain the news got back to them and when they knew that it was real they came looking for Jesus this is one man that found help from the Lord who had leprosy Luke 5, 12 says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold a man full, and I think this one here is full-blown in every way, the look, the grotesqueness of how he looked, his appearance, he had to live with every day, um, probably can't imagine. And he saw Jesus, and when he saw him, he fell on his face, and he, he, said, he besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me clean. And he put forth. Now this is the part that really gets tender. We're not sure from the narrative. We're sure of one thing. We're not sure if the man approached Jesus and fell at his feet, feet, face at his feet. Or he called for Jesus and Jesus went towards him. But we do know that there was a meeting. Whether the leper came to Jesus or Jesus went to the leper that leper probably felt something he hadn't felt in years. He felt a human touch. And probably might have broke him at his heart because nobody had touched him probably in years. You know, every human needs touch. You need your mama's touch. Got to have that touch, amen? You need your children's touch. Just think about going through life and never been touched by anybody. Now this morning we walked around and hugged. If you missed out on get a hug, you let me know when church is over and we'll line up again and catch you on your way out the door. <laughs> because it is essential that humans know what it means to be touched. Do you know they've done a report on what happens to babies that are left and not touched? It creates emotional and mental and psychological issues when you do not touch. You say, but that's a baby. Even, how do they put it? Even a thug deserves a hug. That's what I, what I heard. That's what a guy who just got out of prison told me one time. He said, you know, even in prison, even a thug want a hug. That's the way he put it. Because we want a human touch. When we're born, we want somebody to touch us. As we live in, we want somebody to touch us. And I've been in the hospital as people were on their way out the door with family members all around them, rubbing them, touching them, because we, we desire that touch. My own father said to me in his last few hours before he left this earth, he said, son, he said, don't leave me, stay here with me, because we desire to have that touch of human contact. But this man, who knows how long he had been without having a touch, but the Bible says the Lord reached out his hand. Under the law, he could have been stoned. But with Jesus, he found grace and mercy. And he says, I will be thou clean. And the scripture tells me in verse 13, not somewhere by and by and down the road and gradually. You hear what I'm saying? I, 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 I hope you don't have a struggle with this, but my Jesus was a wonder worker. He is a miracle worker. And he immediately, just instantly healed this man, and he knew that he was clean. Now, I believe because of this man's healing, I know that Jesus tells him in, in uh, verse 14 what to do, but watch verse 15. Because of his healing, 
so much the more went there what? A fame, meaning this was known. I have no doubts that at a later date on this final journey to Jerusalem, these 10 have come into contact with the Lord and they've got this word and they have come looking for a miracle. They have also come seeking mercy and they are going to find what they're looking for. Now, go back to Luke 17 with me. In Luke 17, they lift up their voice, voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy. And when he saw them, it seemed strange, go to the priest. He didn't touch them. They were at a distance. He spoke a word. Now, they are more than likely Jewish men because they have been instructed to go to the priest. And you know your Bible. In the Old Testament, the priest had a function in this leprosy thing. Now, here's what they had. They, had the, they were the uh, disease control inspectors, according to Luke 13 and 14. Their job was if there was a hint, they checked the skin to see if the spot, how it was, was there hair, was it white, facial. They checked uh, not only persons, they checked clothing, and they checked even the home, and if the home found, had problems, they would burn it, get rid of it. If there was no issue, for example, if you were someone who had, um, well, some of us just got this anyway. You notice that as you get old, you get these things called aging spots. Glad I'm not in this thing by myself. All of a sudden, you get this little dot that looks white. Can I get a witness in here this morning? I'm not in this by myself. You wonder, what happened? Well, your pigment stopped working. It's not leprosy. Hold on. But they would have to investigate all of that. You had people who were born uh, albinos. There's a skin disease. I think Michael Jackson and a few other people had it. What they call it? Bidiligo, where you, you basically just your skin begins to change. Well, that's not leprosy, but they had to inspect it to see what it was. But when leprosy was found, the priest had the job of saying, you have to go. Seven, it was a fair process, they checked it, they, then they say you have to go, and when you have to go, it didn't matter how rich you were, even the king, one of the kings got leprosy, he had to go out the house of God, couldn't come back. It didn't matter who it was, your social status, your age, the moment you had leprosy, you had to go. That was it. You didn't die, but you would begin to experience what is called a living death in isolation and separation for others. And the priest could pronounce you unclean. But to be pronounced clean, it would also take a priest. Now, throughout the hi Israel's history, it's history. Matter of fact, throughout the world history, there's only two people in the Old Testament that were healed by a miracle from leprosy. One of them was Miriam, and that was before the laws were given regarding leprosy, what to do and not do. And the other one was a Gentile whose name was Naaman the Syrian. Look over, if you would, please, in Luke chapter 4. You want me to sing with you back there? All right. Luke 4. Is that uh, beans, greens, tomatoes, potatoes, yams? <laughs> Look over in Luke chapter 4. Look at verse 27. Now this statement upset the Jews. It upset them. Because he's reminding Israel about a widow woman. There were many widows in Israel during the days of Elijah. But only one of them was fed supernaturally and she wasn't Jewish. She was Gentile. And then again, he says there were many lepers, verse 27, in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet. He says, and not one of them was clean, save Naaman the Syrian, meaning someone who's of an alien race. God fed a Gentile woman, and God cured a Gentile man with leprosy, and that didn't happen supernaturally to the children of Israel ever, particularly the leprosy part. And so Naaman was not subject 
or under the principles. He wasn't declared. As a matter of fact, interestingly, in Syria, he still functioned with the king and went with the king because they didn't isolate it as a ceremonially unclean thing. Leprosy has a seven-year incubation period. That's what it has. From the time you're exposed to the time it shows up, it can take seven years. But then once it shows up, it can move very, very slow. It can move gradually, but it's going to move. It may take 30 years before it's full-blown, and you could function somewhat normally if you're not infectious. But once you get the lesions and the, and the breaks, that's when society wants your way. Naaman seemed to function pretty good. He had a wife. The reason he wound up over there is that uh, his wife got the news from the, the, the little servant girl. There's a prophet over here. And that's how he got the news to go there. But no one had been declared clean by the law. Everybody had been declared unclean. Go back to Luke 17. But when they met Jesus, Luke 17, when they met the Lord Jesus Christ, they cried out for mercy. And he showed it. In verse 14, he says in, to them, go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. There's an interesting aspect about this faith. And that is, is that they weren't cleansed when he first spoke. In order for this miracle to take place, they had to hear him from a distance. Go show yourself to the priest still leprous and they had to turn and start walking towards the priest still leprous and it is only as they went they were cleansed that's a walk of faith now listen to me some of us have the idea that God will do certain things in our life when the situations and circumstances change Lord, as soon as there's enough money, I'll follow your instructions. I think you ought to obey the Lord now. Don't wait. Follow him now and then watch him do the miracles. Lord, I'll, I'll start serving you and serve you in church when I get my family issues straightened out. Duh. Won't you put it, won't you start following him now and then expect that he's going to bless you or help you as you're going along the way. What faith is it to say, when I see it, I'll do it? This was a faith that says, I heard you, and faith cometh by hearing. And now I'm acting on what I heard. I'm on my way to the priest. And the scripture says, as they went. Not seeing, not comprehending, and let me help you with faith. Faith does not have to understand. Faith believes. I was not there when God flung all of this universe into the existence with a word, but Hebrews says, by faith I understand it. I wasn't there. But I believe the record. And I believe the account. They believed the Lord's word and they moved on it. Now, you will do what God wants you to do. You won't make excuses. Some people are saying, I'll give up my vices when I get stronger. And I'm saying, just obey the Lord now. And see what happens as you're going along the way. The nature of God is this. He brings to them and to us a wonderful opportunity of experiencing something that you can only experience through him. Now watch this. The definition of faith, here it is. It is trusting, following, and obeying God when nothing has changed and you don't understand. That's faith. Faith is not visual. It's not even explainable. Uh, if someone asks you to explain your faith, you're wasting your time. Just declare it. When the Bible says, in the beginning, God, there is not any verses before that that explains anything. It just says, in the beginning, God. Case closed. 
that's where I stand. And the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. Now, we've done, dealt with the ten, their leprosy. They met the Lord. But verse 15, and one of them, when he saw he was healed, verse 14 says they were cleansed. Verse 15 says he was healed, and there is a different word there. Now, stay with me. <laughs> Up until now, it's been, it's been what we call, my terminology is not new, it's what we call group think. Okay? Because you got 10 lepers. And I kind of feel like if one leper said, hey man, let's go over to that hill today, everybody said, okay, we ain't got nothing to do, let's go to that hill. There's 10 of them, they're in the same boat. You know, it's, it's a funny thing about misery, it loves company. And somebody said, well, let's just go sit under that shade tree. Okay, group think, let's go. Like, like fish that turn together, birds that fly in a, in a flock. They have been together so long that they got group think. It's not, but a common situation has developed this. And this, the reason being is they all have leprosy. Now let me ask everybody here a question. We on a boat. Boat just sink. There's a lifeboat. Do you get to the boat and say, who's in here before I get in? At this point in time, getting in a lifeboat is it it, ha, it makes I don't care if you're rich, poor, black, white, I don't care if you what age you are, you want to get in the boat that's gonna save you. Forget about what's going on. We call that foxhole. These ten lepers have been running together like this because now, hey, it's not Jewish and Samaritans, it's not age, how old. It's not social status. Uh, I was a prince's son. I was a, a carpenter. It is not education, PhD versus none. It's just leprosy. And all of them got it. Part of our world's problem is it doesn't understand we all got the same problem. Every human being has the same problem. It may not be leprosy, but I do know what we all have in common, and we are all in the same boat of misery. Do you understand that? And I can prove it. Because everybody in the boat was born, and everybody in the boat going to die. Same common problem. But when you group think, you, distinctions kind of go away. Now, I don't know when it was. Somewhere, 10 guys are headed back. And, and, and look at the last part of verse 16. Because the one that turned back was a what? Okay, this is important in the story. This is extremely important, or he wouldn't have mentioned it. Because if he's a Samaritan, that means he's not Jewish. So, Lord, 10 lepers. Heal us, Lord, have mercy. Jesus to the ten, go show yourself to the priest. Group think. The Samaritans in the group, okay, we've been turning together. We're going to all obey together, and he's on his way. Then he had to have a look. Matter of fact, he had three looks. First of all, he had to look at himself. Because not only him, all ten of them, the scripture says they were cleansed as they went, meaning their skin and their issues, regardless of what they were, as it was in Luke 5, immediately went away. Immediately went away. All of them. Now, don't you think it's time to take a look and see is this a praiseworthy moment that you can look and know that you're different? This is a, this is a hold my mule moment right here. This is like, this is not just an ordinary thing. I was a leper a minute ago, and now I'm clean. Don't you tell me I shouldn't be looking at that. You should. So he has this look at himself, but then he has to look ahead. Hey, where am I headed? I'm headed to, with them to see the priest. Whoa, wait a minute. This is a wait a minute moment. Wait a minute. Hold up. Why am I going to the priest? Because now the group think stops. 
And now what he's saying is, wait a minute, time out. I, I, and I don't know, I hope they don't get mean to him and say, listen, we were with you when we were a leper, but now that we're clean, we got to cut you loose. I hope, I hope they didn't think that way. But he instinctively knew where they were going and what they were about to do was not relative to him. So he stops his journey and starts thinking, what's ahead of me? Priest, wait a minute. I'm a Samaritan. What is going to the priest going to do for me going to him? He didn't pronounce me unclean. And secondly, I'm a Samaritan. He's not going to have anything to do with me when I get there. So why am I going to him? So now that he can't look forward, come on church, he ain't got but one way to look. Let me think about this for a moment. This is a wait a minute moment. This is, wait a minute, the priest didn't do anything for me and the law over here didn't help me so I need to go back down here where I got my real help. And so he returns. And this is what I want to use called turning thanks. Some of you, if you're like me, I am, I'm hoping God will help me. I am so guilty and humanly speaking, we don't want to be. But we're guilty sometimes of accepting the gifts of God without thinking about the one who gave the gift. So we're going to bless that bird on Thursday. And we'll pronounce a hallelujah over the turkey and everything else. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with turkey. Me and him are going to meet. But you got to go beyond that. Me and Tom are going to have a meeting. But you got to go well beyond that. This is what this wait a minute moment does for this man because now he goes back and he falls on his face at the feet of Jesus. And when he, when he, when he gets there, he is on his face praising him. And if you look at verse 15, and with a loud voice, he is thanking and glorifying God. Now hear me. I'm thankful for my health. But that is not the real motivation for praising God. You, you're going to go out and get in a car and drive home. I thank God that he gives me wheels to drive, but that is not the motivation. Some of us got two, three, four, five cars. That's not the motivation to thank God. I thank him for the house that he allows me to lay my head in every night. But that is not the true motivation of praising and thanking God. You see, while we're sometimes focused on what he gives us, where our true devotion should not be is not on the gift, but on the giver. So it's not beans, greens, tomatoes, potatoes. I'm, I'm thankful for those things. But you know what? He deserves our glory anyway. That's the point. Now, the question in verse 17. Were there not ten cleans, but where are the nine? There is a, I call it a subplot. Sometimes when you're reading a storyline, there's another storyline running in the background, and this is one of those. Because when he asks, where were the nine, we could answer because we know where they were. We know they were on their way to see the priest. This is not a, a question to but, uh, malign them and make them look bad because they were going to see the priest like he told them to. But there's a subplot here. And while they were on their way, this one came back. Now he's on his way to Jerusalem. And stay with me. The miracles of Jesus, the miracles that he gave his apostles to perform, and the miracles that he gave the 70 to perform, I read one writer say this. He said, apart from the unbelief of some cities and some people, Jesus could have healed and did heal all of the sicknesses that existed in Israel at that time. Apart from those who did believe. Now let me give you a verse to meditate on. Hold your finger in Luke 17. Jump over to John 20 with me. John 20. Hold your finger in Luke. 
Look at verse 30. The Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, this is what he wants you to have, that you might have life through his name. Look at John chapter 21, and look at verse 24. He writes, and, and, I, and I have to believe he's close to it, there's not one time that Jesus had someone come to him or was brought to him that he didn't heal. And there are cities that would not Accept him, and the apostle says, Lord, do you want us to call fire down because of their unbelief? He said, that's not my spirit. I'm not coming to bring no judgment, not now. That's coming later. And everywhere he went, if you touched the hem of his garment, you got it. If you approached him and said you had something going on with your servant at a distance, you got it. Everywhere he went, John 21 and 24 says, this is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony of true. And verse 25 says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every single thing he did was written down. Here's what he says. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And I have to believe, based on this verse, you can't just look at the gospel. His ministry was extensive. And the ability to heal the nation because he was the Messiah was there. But while there was physical healing for the nation, they needed another type, and so do you and I. You see, the physical is not all that you need. You hear me? While we enjoy the physical, physical health, physical well-being, don't you get twisted and believe that's all you're going to need. And I can say concerning this Samaritan, this one man, he got it right. He understood. I'm walking with them. I'm cleansed. I'm whole. I didn't do this. The priest didn't do that. Jesus did that. And he comes back not just because he's got a whole body, he wants to be whole with the person that healed his body. Now, the person who healed his body can heal everything else. Do you know that man's greatest need is not his physical? It's not what's out here, it's his spiritual. As a matter of fact, God said, I can put it to you this way, if you had the whole world, it wouldn't profit you anything if you lose your soul. So we know that it is more. Thanksgiving is coming. And I know I've been to, I, I went on to the store to get out the crowd, shop a little bit at a time. But we don't just shop for Thanksgiving, but we decided to get a few things out of the way because I don't want to get caught up in that crowd. Uh, and they get a little, they get a little, they'll get a little testy. And I didn't want to be there for no Friday when they're acting crazy. So I just said, let me go get what I need to get now. But you know what? I hope I get this right. I hope you get it right. It isn't about what would be eaten on Thanksgiving Day. I hope I get this right. I hope I get it right in my spirit that no matter what I live in, how, what you wear, how you drive, what you know, I hope I get this right that the real story here is not the lepers. It's Jesus. He is the one who made everything possible. I hope I get it right that if, if there's anything happening good in your life, it's not because you deserved it or earned it. It is all because of, of him. Every bit of it is because of him. If you're retired, you've been blessed. Your 401k, if you set up, you've been blessed. But I hope you don't get locked in. You're going to need more than a 401k when this thing is over with. You see, the, the, the real bank account is not down here. And the real de declaration of whether you're well or not is not here. We don't want to just be healed of leprosy and sickness. I want to live in a world where you can't even grow old. And guess who makes that possible? It's Jesus. It will be him. Nobody else but Jesus. Now, this morning, I want to leave you with this thought. Have we examined whether we 
whether our spirits fit the nine or whether it fits the one. And have we examined the relationship of the one to Jesus? I think as a, as a picture, I said running in the background, Israel got from their Messiah healing. What they didn't get was spiritual restoration. And that's why they're still in trouble today. And you and I don't want to miss this boat. You get one chance. If you get one chance in life to meet Jesus, and if it's today, you ought to be on your face saying, Jesus, have mercy. And while you may not be physically unclean, you are spiritually unclean. And you should be calling on him for mercy. And don't let what he did 2,000 years ago be in your mind. That was then. Nope. The same Jesus who healed then is still taking care of people today. And let me tell you how I know. Over 43 years ago, he took care of Dwight Scott. Amen. 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 Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our altar is open. And that spirit and attitude of thanksgiving that we want to render to the Lord can be done here at the altar. If we have, as we all do, taken for granted things we should not have taken for granted. If we have lived selfishly thinking it was us and it's all the time has been him, we need to let him know, Lord, I want to get this right. I, I want to be that one that gets it right. And if you're here today physically blessed, but spiritually destitute. You need him. I'm talking about Jesus. And you need him because he's the only perfect person that ever lived. He's the one God sent to die for the sins of the whole world. And he was the only one resurrected from the grave. And he is the only one that can serve as a mediator for you today. You need him. You need him. And so the altar while the piano plays, if you need to father the Lord and believe his baptism, and uh, if you've talked to someone before and you're interested in joining our church or would like to talk to someone about joining our church, you can come and someone will speak to you. I'll speak to you and we'll see what uh, you, you, you want to do and your wishes are. And we'll be a help as best we can. So while the piano plays, would you stand with me, please?